three hours today and uh, have a lot to cover. I, this is probably the most ambitious three hours that I've tried to pack in in all of the times I've taught this class, but three or four times on the shortcut and many times with other companies and so on. So it's going to be, you know, I hope intense. And uh, <laughs> feel free to just stop me anytime. And uh, there's no protocol here. It's totally interactive. And if we don't get through the whole thing, that's fine. It's still very ambitious, but we'll still get through the key stuff, right? So um, the flow is a bit new, and therefore, uh, even I'm just like, you know, just trying it out. So what we're trying to do in the first part is to understand not just behavior and the design of behavior, but also the design of behavior for the digital context, which is what we're interested in. There's lots of behavioral design that happens in other contexts that are non-digital. We're in a startup digital sort of a space here, and uh, it's called School of Startups. And Digital is the predominant technology of our day, so we're going to, ah, oh, that's really great. That is really great. Um, so then, focusing on that digital part becomes, I think, really important. The other half is actually to go into a tool that I've developed that you guys can use. And, right, so that's the big question, right? There's so much of this everywhere. Uh, this I saw in a TV series. There's some conversation going on in the middle of it. This lady says, oh, behavior changes. Behavior change takes a long time. Uh, if you look at the media, these are actually slightly older news pieces. But if you look at the media, they look at research, media, technology, science. You're going to see things like perception, motivation, behavior. All of these related to psychological terms pretty much everywhere. The field is just exploding. It's been. It has this so much in, insanely good research in psychology and behavioral science today that it's, it's going, it's, it's really, there's a lot. So the question is for practitioners, and I come to you as a designer, I don't come to you as a PhD in psychology. My background is in psychology as a, as a bachelor, as a, as a graduate, but then I studied something called interaction design, and then I've been working for 20 years in product companies, essentially technology companies, trying to apply behavioral science into the technology domain. I've worked for corporates, I've worked for places like the city of Helsinki, I've taught at Alto, it's like a, I've been in startups, I've been in very big companies, I've been across the board, consulting companies. So, uh, from an application perspective, when you, when you want to take behavioral science and apply it in your field, and if that field that you're working in has something to do with technology, how should we think about behavior in a very simple way? That's very important. You can get easily lost in all the all the stuff, the content that's out there. So a quick show of hands, how many engineers do we have here? Who would you call yourself engineers? Go for it, go for it, raise your hands. Okay. How many designers do we have here? Okay. And there's a, how about technologists? Uh, sorry, that's sorry, uh, I said technologists already. I mean engineers, technologists, designers, and then like business people. And you count yourself as a business person. Right? I can count you in can, different categories, yeah. but I'll think it's like <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is like that. I mean, no one is you know, specific to one. Um, wherever you approach this uh, behavioral stuff from, I think we need to be clear about what behavior is. And this is how I define it. And it seems to be quite well accepted. Um, before we go there, there's also, you know, not only is behavior in the media, it's in, it's in art, it's everywhere. It's also in politics now. And you guys have heard of Cambridge Analytica, the Facebook scandal. How many of you have heard of Cambridge Analytica? A good show of hands, yeah. And, or, and now we realize that Cambridge Analytica, Analytica took the fall with this uh, whole industry of companies doing this. Um, but essentially using data-driven decision-making, driving opinions, opinion-shaping. It's been going on a long time. It's been happening even before the days of digital technology. Propaganda and influence is an old field. So in all of this kind of you know, mess of behavioral science, what do we, what, what is behavior? 
And behavior is really, you have to think about it as something very, it's very something, it's something very simple, <coughs> fundamental. It's action and it's doing. So what you think isn't behavior, what you perceive, what you know, your intention, your meaning, your soul, your spirit, uh, your purpose, learning, knowledge, memory, cognition, none of that is behavior. So behavior, so if we, if I ask you at the end of the session, did you have a good time? And if all of you say yes, what that meant, what that means to each of you could be quite different. That's a subjective, even though the scale on which I am, on, on which you've rated this session as say, say eight on 10, is the same scale. What that means to you is different. That's a subjective word. That's the word of emotion, perception, cognition. But the behavior is, most of you arrived here on time. The behavior is, 50% of you stayed till half the class. The behavior is, you took 10 notes. The behavior is, you had five conversations. When you do something, you took 10 steps to go to use the washroom. That's behavior. It's not declaration of intent. And it's only one piece of the, of the psychology puzzle. It's, it's only one piece of the human science puzzle. But it's a very, very important piece because there is no other proof in, 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 human, you know, in human life other than doing. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what, what they think. The question is, what do they do? Do they buy the product? Do they vote for the candidate? Do they adopt the child? Do they get the divorce? What do they do? So the decision science behind why we do things, when we do things, and what we do, that is the domain of behavior. And everything else fits into that. So when, you, when you're confused and you think, what is going on? Like, how do I understand behavior? Just think about it as human action or doing. So then the question becomes not what is behavior, but the question becomes what is the design of behavior? If behavior is about action, how do you design human action? Does it make sense so far? Yeah. And that's going to be the purpose of where we are. Um, but before I go there, I wanted to maybe have any thoughts from your side on what you thought about behavior, or if you've done something about behavior, anything you'd like to share in your work, yeah, please. I was looking at it from the perspective of relative response to actions in different contexts. OK. Very short, and I could explain you. Sorry. OK. I thought someone was trying to say. I could like, uh, analyze the fact that a different way. Relative response is like, as you also said, it's not like fixed. Today I give to the same thing, and tomorrow I give to another one. Yeah. And so action, the action part usually could be the constant part. Yeah. But then, the context also is very important. Yes. Because am I happy, am I happy, am I hungry, am I crazy at that time? Yeah. What happened? So that's why I bring those three parts together. Relative response to action yeah. in the first context. Cool. Sounds very good. Yeah. I'll try to touch upon that at some point. Possible. Awesome. Anything else? Um, no, no, small amount of notch theory. Notch theory, yes. It's related to this. It's quite interesting. Yes. I will touch upon that. So if I had to ask you to, hey, just turn over to your you know, friend next to you, your classmate, and tell them what you think about behavior, what would you say? You came here with some idea in your mind. It's a process. Sorry? It's a process. It's a process. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, I think if I ask each of you what you thought about behavior, I'm going to come up with as many answers as there are people in the room. Um, and that's the reason I want to really focus on digital behavior design and kind of look at it from a very particular perspective today. Yeah? So let's jump into it. So understand the design of behavior. We need to understand what, what is the agency, what, is the, what are the factors that actually helps to shape human behavior. And when you talk about digital behavioral design, what is digital? It's a form of technology, right? But in order to understand how behavior really works, of course there is social you know, uh, influence of behavior. I 
influence you to do something. There's also technological influence of behavior. It's your phones influencing you to do something, right? And to understand digital and it's, you know, kind of how it shapes behavior, we've got to step back and look at behavior, uh, look at technology itself as a much, uh, you know, in a much more open um, kind of mindset. And I would like to rephrase and go back to, you know, technology being, I mean, fire being a technology, basically. We don't t tend to think of it that way. But if you think of it from a behavioral perspective, fire is a technology. And the behavior that fire created in humans was gathering, community, storytelling. We formed our first societies because that technology enabled us to perform certain new behaviors, which we didn't before that technology. Farming is essentially a technology. When we could farm, we had a source of food that was in one <coughs> location, so you could settle in all kinds of places, like that remote, difficult place. Why? Because you could grow cereal. You didn't have to wander after animals all the time. So that technology led to this behavior. Paper is essentially a technology. It's one of the oldest technologies we have that refuses to die out even when digital has come along with so much force. And paper has enabled so many behaviors. It has enabled things like learning. It has enabled transportation of knowledge. It has enabled archiving. It's essentially like a, a memory prosthetic. You know, you, it's, a, it's like you're outsourcing human memory and storing it for that, that outlives the individual. It's a very, very powerful technology. The pill is essentially a technology. It changed gender relationships and completely created a new degree of independence, autonomy, and power relationship. It altered that between the genders. Very powerful technology. If you look at digital technology from the perspective of, from this view, as a technology, as tomato is a technology. Industries or highways are a technology. The automobile is a technology. It enabled you to move and it enabled human mobility on a scale never before. When you start seeing this technology that we have from that point of view, you see how technology and behavior are intertwined. The smartphone helps you. It's very interesting, right? Someone had, there was the phone, it became a smartphone. The smartphone only had one camera. It was facing that side. It was facing out like a regular camera. But then people were doing this, right? They were trying to take pictures of themselves, but they couldn't see themselves. Obviously some designer, someone noticed and said, hey, why don't we put a camera on the front? Duh. <laughs> right? So the technology shaped the behavior, which then shaped the technology, which created something called a cultural phenomenon called the selfie. And so we are in constant interaction. We create fire, fire shapes us. We build houses, houses shape how we live. If you build a certain kind of house, you will live in a certain way. It will change your social relations. It will change how you have children. It will change your social you know, dynamic. This is, I bought one of these cameras. And this one here on the left, it has a front facing screen. That's like new in this whole category. The other one is like the popular one, but it doesn't have a screen, that's just a feedback screen. Okay. So people are moving to this really quickly because this front facing screen on this camera is so addictive. Like you try it and then you're like, how did I ever live without a front facing screen on an action camera? Because I'm sticking it on my kayak, I'm putting it on my bike, you know, I'm, whatever I'm doing with it, I want to see myself. If I can't see where I am in the frame, what's the whole point of this damn thing? So, but these guys, they sold millions of cameras, and then this guy comes along, puts a screen in the front, and ships a market. So this is what's going on, people. Technology influences behavior, shapes behavior, and behavior shapes technology, and they're in constant interaction. And Marshall McLuhan was like a famous um, media theorist. And he said, first we shape our tools, Thereafter, they shape us. And that's kind of like the core, you know, thinking behind behavioral design in the digital world. Any questions at this point? Okay. So, at, until now, I've stayed at a pretty high level. And I've been like, well, if 
farming, paper, blah, blah. But look at what happens to human behavior when we adopt digital apps, right? What we used to call photography before Instagram, and what we call photography now, we still call it photography, but we don't do any of the same behaviors. You know, we initially have a camera, you couldn't see what picture you took, you would take it to a store, you would develop a picture, you would store that picture, and when your friend came, you'd pull out that picture and show it to them, and then you'd store it away. That whole series of behaviors is so completely different from look at the scene, change filters right there, maybe I'll use this filter, maybe I'll do this, have editing capabilities on the fly, take a photograph, share it instantaneously, live stream it maybe, and have social conversations around photography. So we, we, we didn't even think about it, but we have been completely shifted from what we do as the behaviors around photography has completely shifted without me even knowing it. Remember the days when you'd like to call, walk to a cab, hail a cab, hello people? There's a whole generation growing up that will not understand that concept anymore. Because you'll be like, you, want, you already know the driver's name, you know where he is or she is, where they're coming from. You pay up front, you take the ride, and if you've left your bag in the car or something, you know exactly where it is, you know exactly who it is. Gone are the days of, oh shit, I left my phone in the car. Oh no, oh no, shit, we shouldn't have had so much to drink over there. The behaviors around what we call cab hailing are changing. That's changing as well. Have you ever considered that, you know, the whole um, Tinder thing of, you know, swiping left and right? It was lifted off of a real human behavior of people walking into a bar, walking into a party, and like mentally swiping people. <laughs> Inter not interesting, <laughs> interesting. That's what you do, right? I mean, if you're in that state of mind, if you're looking for, for looking to meet somebody. So that, that whole human, natural human behavior has been literally turned into an app, which has then changed how we do it. <coughs> it's very, very common now for people to just tell themselves, say, say stuff about themselves. This is me, I have two cats, blah, blah, I like red wine, da, da, da and put it out there in the, public, in the public realm. You're putting out data about yourself in the public realm. It would have been inconceivable 10, 15 years ago, 20 years. People have been like, wow, that's, I would never tell so much about myself to the, to the world, you know? And yet, here we are. So, and now, watch the space very carefully. This and this, these guys, they want to change everything about us. <coughs> because basically, when you start to make purchases, when you start to make decisions, when you start to choose what kind of school your kid should go to. Yeah. Yes, uh, about we putting much of ourselves out there. Hmm? Of course, uh, about we putting much of ourselves out there. Yeah. Uh, because, like, of course, before the mobile phone, like, uh, the first person was, okay. Nobody gonna want to be bothered using mobile phone while working. They want to go home and receive calls. Mm -hmm. The mobile phone thing, not everybody is having it. So the same thing also that I wonder why we still have the privacy laws. Of course, I know privacy laws are more extensive. But then, typically, for an average internet user nowadays, we have like a lot of them, a lot about them out there already. And while the company is still like, or government, the legal part, okay, privacy law, privacy law. And then, like, if you want, you can get it out there. Because mm -hmm. the person even willingly puts all the information out there. Mm -hmm. So like, how do we like balance the two? Or what do you see the future of privacy law? That's my well, question. The, the adoption of technology, any technology, <coughs> is always unequal. Um, and that's why William Gibson, famous science fiction, science fiction author, he said the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Which means that if you put a product, a service, anything out there, it's not going to be accepted, adopted. Some people will volunteer more data. Some people will be more very, very afraid. Some people will, will see it as a threat. And then it's only over a long period of time that you shift an entire market out of landlines to you know handheld phones and from handheld phones to like all your banks that are now telling you, hey guys, your cards are going away, 
options anymore because most people have moved to digital banking or mobile banking. No one does that in analog anymore. So they're just moving the last people on. So you'll always have different reactions. The future of privacy, that's a huge question. That's a huge conversation. It's very complex. It, I mean, legalities, different regions of the world, depending on how fascist they are, how open they are, how liberal, all of that, sensibilities of people. That's, that's, that needs a workshop. But if you look at what's happening here, you would walk, you would browse, you walk to the store, browse the ales, pick your product, pay and carry, and I still shop mostly like this. But then once you have one of these, you can be talking to Alexa, and you're talking about the weather, and you're just saying, well, it looks like great autumn weather. And if you tried one of these, they're getting more and more conversational. They're not yet there, but they're getting very conversational. They can just be like, hey, how's your morning? And then you respond to them like a human being. Because conversation, voice, when it's right, it's so intuitive to us. It's not like tapping a screen. It, eh, eh, eh. It's just someone saying, hey, how are you feeling this morning? You say, I feel like shit. Really, why? I don't know. It's that work from yesterday. Really, have you tried this new something? So product placement, marketing, inside a conversation, inside context. How much more context do you need? So, and the privacy behind that. Yes, I want the benefit of that contextual guidance, but who knows who gets to access that data? That's, that's, that's a whole different debate, right? So these devices are still coming. Some parts of the world, there's lots of them. And again, they're unequally adopted. Some of them, some people are using them a lot. But they're essentially trying to change us behaviorally from doing a lot of things which we did non-conversationally into doing them through conversations. Such as counseling, such as relationships, such as learning, such as whatever, right? Same with this. The Apple Watch came up with a new app which detects if you are susceptible to dementia. Dementia is a huge, you know, growing problem. I'm actually working on a product around dementia in VR. Um, and Apple comes up with an app that can detect from your bodily patterns and your, I don't know what they're doing, but they can kind of give you some fair degree of prediction on how susceptible you might be to dementia. So they are, what, what used to happen with health was that you would find something is wrong, you would schedule a visit with a doctor, you would go consult a doctor and you would get some diagnosis and medicate. Now it's all prognosis. We are preparing to anticipate the possibility of health problems much before they arise. How? Through technology. Augment yourself. Wear something that measures your heart rate. Something that knows, can get big data patterns and give you some kind of predictive analysis. But that also means that our behaviors around health change. So these are just some examples to show you that you know these things uh, these things fundamentally change how we behave. And so, when I work with these technology companies, and if you're interested in working in behavioral design, and if you're interested in applying behavioral design on any project at all, it could be a non-profit, it could be an impact project, it could be about ocean cleanup. Uh, it need not necessarily have to do with technology, but the question is, how does that service change human behavior? How does it change the behavior of people who work on the project, or behavior of people who are impacted by the project? And how can we do it in a transparent and open way? Because technology changing behavior is going to happen anyways. That's, that's how these things are related. So we can't be in denial and say, oh my god, that's, that sounds so unethical to do this whole behavioral shaping thing. Whatever you create is going to end up changing the behavior of the people that it touches. If it's effective at all, it will change someone's behavior somewhere. Whether you're building a road, or building an app, or creating a service, you're going to change someone's life. So you might as well think about it, right? And be very clear about how you're doing it. So the behavioral design approach is start to design the behavior first and not the technology as a separate piece. 
Any questions at this point? Any thoughts? Okay, no worries. Um, this is then. There's this thing called essentially called dark patterns, and this is not what we this is what we don't want to do. There's something called darkpatterns.net, and you can see it's compiled by a UX designer. And if you go there, you'll see that you know we've all been at some time or the other we've been you know victim to this stuff. It's when your credit card is charged twice, you don't know it, or you can't unsubscribe from that newsletter. Uh, there's a whole list of these dark patterns. But the problem with manipulating people to do something is that even you can, you, even if you fool them once, you're not going to get them back. You're building a sort of animosity. You're building anger. You're building resentment. You might get so unless you're a unless you're a grifter, unless you you know you plan to make your living through scamming people. Uh, I would. The ethical and the kind of like the understanding that behavioral design is not about manipulation, it's not about trickery, it's not coercion. It's rather this. It's how to give people agency over their own well-being. They want the technology. They want it to be able to call a cab better, date better, educate better, eat better. How can you, how can you do it with that consciousness, with their consent, so that they are aware? And so that they can experience the benefit. I think that should be the ballpark of behavioral change and behavior design. Please, can you go back to the yes. previous slide? Yes. Previous slide. The last one on the dark, whatever. Yeah. Misdirection. Design mm -hmm. mostly focus your attention on one thing and shift your mind on it. Yeah. And the this one, of course, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in designing, but there's something we call visual hierarchy in design yes. projects. And uh, I was going to call that also like some sort of like misdirection because like if I want people to focus on maybe the play button, the call to action button basically. Yeah. And I create it in such a way that I create a kind of higher visual hierarchy based on that. Mm -hmm. Is that also like on the dark side or okay. I don't think so. I mean to to intentionally design behavior and be open about this is the behavior that we want to design. We are I have a business, I sell eggs. I want you to buy my eggs. There is nothing wrong in admitting that my store is designed to make you to buy eggs. Is our eggs bad for you? That's a problem. If I'm trying to sell you like five liter Coke bottles, you know, that's is, a... Is, is the third behind it, basically? Yes. And visual hierarchy is a neutral thing. I mean, visual hierarchy is essentially, I mean, if you look at the... Um, But like, yeah, I mean, if you, uh, if you have, sorry, I'll just go back to this. So if you have like a, a buy button that's, you know, explicitly put there to drive people to purchase or download, I mean, all design is about getting people to do something. I don't think that's a dark pattern. Misdirection is the button says click here to download a white paper, but then it redirects you to some gambling site. Right? <laughs> or that's no. That ain't happening. You give you you give them put a button to download white paper, then give them the damn white paper. It's as simple as that. That's fine. Right? And so it's so funny, but this all this behavioral stuff, these all these abstract ideas. They come down to very concrete things in the digital world. All those snaps, swipes, rolls, pauses, I would like you never to look at your devices the same way again. Every time you're pushing something there, every time you're looking at a screen, every time you're opening a screen up, you're actually participating in the design of someone else's behavioral pattern. Someone has designed that behavior for you. Someone is hoping you will push like, someone is hoping you will comment. And obviously, a lot of it is being done that's just going over the top. I'm not saying it's all good, but that's basically what's happening, especially in the digital world. 
but that's but we need to stay there. That is the space. That's where we need to work. That's where the good work can happen, and the, all the you know addiction and all of that can happen in the same space. But the interesting thing about this picture, which is actually really bad, I just made it yesterday, is that the line between the behaviors of our daily life, such as shopping, walking, eating, and what we do on digital, these lines are blurring. So it's like I say, hey man, let's get lunch, and you say, yes, we're having a conversation, this is very face-to-face, -face. it's analog, right, real world. And then you're like, hey, wait, let me pull up my calendar. Suddenly you're in the digital world. And you're like, how's next Thursday? I'm like, not really, oh yeah. We do this seamlessly, we jump in and out of real world and digital world and real world and digital world. And our, and our behavior of setting up a meeting is a combination of both. So when you design those scrolls, taps, likes, shares, think about the context, the real world context, within which those actions are happening. How does it support the behavior that people want to do? Right? Guys, am I just going on and on? Someone wants to talk, say something. Hello! <laughs> Say something, people. Sorry? It's good? At least for me, I'm just hanging on to your every word. Okay, cool. As long as it's not just. So, this is. I mean, as a speaker, it's kind of deafening sometimes to just hear your own voice, you know? It's like, is anybody getting anything? I do have some exercises for you where I will. Yeah, you can mingle and do some fun stuff. But, so. So you have all this real world stuff going on and with inside that real world stuff you have all the swiping and liking and pushing buttons and all that stuff. And but how do we what do we need to keep in mind when designing uh, digital products and services? And I think this is the, probably the most important slide that I try to show all my customers, all my students, whoever in that entire presentation. It's not even about behavior. It is about behavior, but it's not about you know the design of behavior or any of that. It's just the world in which we live today is squished for attention. There's a zillion things competing for your attention. So the, can anybody tell me what product? Anyone working on a startup here? Yes, sir. What product or service? What does your product do? Um, I create this programming game for elementary school students. Okay, so kids can learn programming. Yes, exactly. You may have, but have you considered what are they doing right now which your game will have to replace? Because they're doing something right now. Yeah. And we never tend to think of our end users as already busy. We think they're just somehow just sitting there waiting for a beautiful app or game to land in their lap and they're just going to pick it up. No, they have an app store full of products, services, parents, teachers, uncles, aunties, neighbors, the youth, everything, clamoring even for the kids' attention. So the challenge becomes, how do you compete? How do you even get anywhere into that shrinking real estate, the cognitive real estate, which is shrinking? And I'm sorry, I didn't let you answer, but I'm just trying to make a point. It's okay. But maybe you do. Yeah. Have you thought of that? Or, yeah, I have. Yep. Yeah. How, how, how do you approach that? Um, I've been interviewing teachers and yeah. finding out about competition and all that stuff. Yeah. Good. So I'm just saying, um, human time and attention is crashing, and the products, services, content, friends, <coughs> is only going up. So these things, they can't, this is not sustainable, guys. It's not possible for this thing to go on. Like, and, yet, and it is going to go on. You're going to have VR. I mean, have you guys set out Amazon Prime streaming? It's three and a half euros a month. The content is amazing. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's like, sorry, yeah, if you like Netflix, this is like, you know, Bezos is pulling, he's taking it out. So if I really get the last point, yes. it's like, the attention table, or let's just call it like a table, yeah. how does it feel? Uh, let's see it as a clock. You only have 24 hours in the day, okay. 8 hours to sleep, 8 hours to, well, let's say 8 hours to sleep. Another 4 or 5 hours to do all your you know, cleaning, hygiene, maintenance stuff. The rest of that time, 
is never, ever going to get more. But the amount of products, services, apps, content competing to take that time is exponentially growing. It's not growing like five, it's growing as an exponential curve. And everyone's connected. The more people get connected, the more content comes online. Yeah, I've never so, actually thought about that before. Mm -hmm. very like, That's because that means that somebody is already engaged with something else. Actually, everyone uh, is already <coughs> engaged in something all the time. That we are we are doing something called mindfulness as a cultural thing, so we can finally take a break, sit down, and do nothing. <laughs> it's become like important to, to consciously do nothing. That's how busy we are with our brains. So think very deeply, what are the behaviors around my product or service? If, do I want to engage my customer on the metro? Do I want to engage them in the school? Do I want to engage them in the old age home? Do I want to engage them on holiday? Next question, what are they already doing there? They're already on Instagram there, they're already at the hotel, they're already... There's hundred things lined up already trying to get their time and attention and how on earth is your product or service going to get in there, make sense to them. And that's the reason the profitability of companies like Facebook and Google have grown so large because of this problem that attention is finite. You don't have unlimited attention. So once you have those 6 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion users, you got them. Facebook has it. Facebook has your attention. They have a, the attention of four billion people or whatever on the planet right now. How do you how do you reach those people? Through Facebook. Knock knock mark, please. Can I? It's okay. Actually, hi. Yeah. That's that, it's just human nature, and it's not Facebook as evil. It's just human nature. They got that market, right? And. I'm not saying that's going to be the end of the world. Um, I'm not even predicting the future of social media is going to be the way it is. Uh, I just think these things change. Like Google didn't exist 10, 15 years ago. I mean, or 20 years ago. There was something called Netscape. Who knows what that is today, right? Xerox, wow. They had a huge, they had the world's leading research division, PARC, some of the best human computer design and research came out of there. Where are they now? Nowhere. So we don't know if Apple is going to exist tomorrow. We don't know if Tesla is going to be the leading you know, technology player. But that's the problem. So what I wanted to do was, since we went through all this, and got quite deeply into behavior, can someone summarize for me, like, what, what is behavior now, do you think, in the digital world? Uh, it continues with the team. That's the only guy talking. Oh, are, you like the, are you like the party representative? <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you like the party representative? Have they all voted for you? Um, I'm I, no, please stop. Please stop. It's just another behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's actually good. But I'm looking to hear from, I don't know. I'm going to do a couple of small exercises, so I just want to <coughs> want to hear something from you guys. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> it's like uh, the way the way that people interact with each other and with the services. It's like what people do. Yeah. It's what people do. Actions. It's action. It's what people do on the device. It's what people do through the device. And all of these are kinds, of, these are all verbs, you know? Walking, browsing, picking, paying, chatting, ordering, using, creating. All these are doing. It's not thinking, it's not feeling, it's not emotional. Ah, I like this app. That's not behavior. That's just an emotional reaction. Are you using the app? Are you wearing it? Are you pushing any button on it? That's behavior. So, how do you take all of that stuff and bring it down to usage? So, in order to talk about this a little bit, I came up with a few examples. This one, I'll, I just want to you know, talk about four or five examples uh, on, with connected to mobile apps. And this one uh, is essentially the problem I found with these apps 
It's just having a behavioral conversation, okay? So there's no goal here, just having a bit. The one of these apps, after I downloaded them for a week, triggered me to do anything. No behavioral design. There's no behavioral design on the team. They built the app, they put it online, you download it, nothing happens. If you forget about it, it forgets about you. <laughs> Where is the behavioral engagement? Why don't you send me a notification? Why don't you do something? If I leave you alone, are you just going to vanish? Right? That's a problem. Right? What about this? Do you, can someone comment about any behavioral issues? Plus, mine, it could be positive, negative. Yes? Um, uh, yeah. Just to get back to the notifications, I yeah. usually put them off because they are irritating. Sure. <laughs> sure. So. My, mine were not. Mine were not. I yeah. Mean. But I have so many apps if they would be all on if my phone was ringing all the time. So. Sure. So that's why I usually put them on. Uh, absolutely. And I mean, you know, Sorry. one one big, uh, just to touch that point, one big <coughs> issue here is that because of this problem, too much in too little time, mm. most services ended up, end up interrupting us. Like 99% mm. of the time. Mm. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. But the question... But we, uh, but we, yeah, but, but the question I have already is that do you go into some other ones and which one and why? Like maybe WhatsApp... That's a good question. Because like, I, I see this concept as if you give customer what they need and you really solve the problem. You don't have to yell and, okay, I'm here, look at me. Yes. Because yeah. that's what WhatsApp does and that's what Facebook does. Because yes. Because, okay, I want to get an audience about my friends, I exactly. want to my family. You've got and it. I have a reason to go there. You got it. And think about it didn't come to my house and say, would you just please sign up? Exactly. Because I know they also, it takes a time for them to like, get there. But I think if there's a remit, and if there's a resolution, exactly. I think that's where most of the startups we fail most of the time because we go crazy about our idea. Okay, this is the best thing that's going to save the world. And we start building it and we push it there. And nobody wants it because it's not solving every problem. Yeah, it's always our own problem. The, the notification thing is actually a huge problem because it's a design problem. And it's a format problem. And when I say format, I mean the phone. The, 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 the iPhone or the smartphone has a certain form factor. Uh, it has a certain design, if you will. And it supports something called notification. And when you start having too many notifications, they become interruptions. So it's a huge problem because we're stuck in a design limitation. But imagine if I was in the rain and I needed to go somewhere and this guy told me at that point that, hey, there are actually fares going, you know, half rate right now from your spot. That would be a good notification for me. Except I've turned off my notifications because there's just too many irrelevant ones, so they crowd out the good ones. The problem is not in the alerting, it's in the design of notifications itself. There is, we, we have not evolved a way to notify it's almost like Google should give you a sort of like control on the top, Rele give me only relevant location based, I don't know, notifications or something, right? What if like Eventbrite, if I had free time, if someone canceled, I don't know why these guys don't do these things, but this is for me real behavioral design. If this guy knows, can connect with my calendar, and someone has just canceled a meeting with me, and it knows my interest through Facebook, because I have signed in through Facebook, what is wrong? Why can't he suggest to me, there's this cool startup event going on and it looks like you have two hours free. <laughs> Not like all the, you know, this is happening today, this is happening today, this is happening, oh God, please. <laughs> but when I need it, it ain't happening. <laughs> you know? When I get the email, data, like about you and about your things that are going with yeah. you, um, and I think that will again interrupt your privacy. Yeah, so, so the privacy happens. thing, like you, like he said, it comes up everywhere. And like I said, people will adopt it differently. I personally am for giving all my data in, in, in response for benefits yeah. if it is given to a secure source that I can trust. Yeah. So perhaps like the more you interact with the app, the more it will know about you and the more yes. you might get the relevant notification that is. It should be designed yeah. that way. Yeah, some machine. In my opinion, it should be designed that way. <coughs> Maybe they See, know when you're acting on it. Another thing, this, again, it, because this, you know, 
human attention and time and action is so scarce, whenever someone interacts with your product or service, consider it an investment. You should treasure it because they are giving you their time and energy, you know, compared to everything else available, they have chosen to tap your app. That's a big deal. And I don't think a lot of companies appreciate just usage as like how valuable it is. It's like you walked into my store. There are a million stores you walked into my store. You're a valuable customer to me. Or whatever. You know. you need not always be business. All right. But yeah, tell me about this. What do you see? Come on, guys. Use those gray cells. Behavioral change, what's going on? Is there any behavioral design happening on the screen? Just ignore the ad. Besides the ad, I mean the product. Only well, yeah, you can't access the site unless you give in that information. Which one? Ask. Okay, very good. So there's an ask for data. Add your salary to unlock everything. Yeah? The advertisement? Yeah. There's an issue for users who haven't had a job before because they can't add a review website. Yes. It's targeting people's curiosity um, and what other people are looking for. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems that the whole like app is founding on the idea that companies are transparent in their dealings, which is not actually automatic. So that would be the behavior change, I guess, that companies should be transparent in a sense. Yes, sure, absolutely. I mean, all of your answers are right. And if you look at it, this whole adding review of salary is, is repeated twice. So what they essentially, the behavioral change they're trying to drive is that we are not just offering anything up on a platter. We are able to give this to you if you are able to tell us about yourself. The more you tell us, the more we can tell you. Right? It's quite fairly obvious, but that's a very subtle, and actually this design isn't supporting that really well. It could be done much better, much more clear and loud, like establishing that sort of trust. Okay. Uh, well, this I think is a is something there. What about this one? <laughs> Cookies, which are very nice. <laughs> We care about your data, and we, you know, there's this sort of emotion in the usage of cookies. We care about you. We want to make it nice for you. Learn more. There's the option to say okay. There's an option to say no thanks. You can also opt out. But so, also as well, the the okay option is nice, bright green with a nice cookie in it. Yes. yes. And the no thanks one is just yes. No yes. That's visual hierarchy. And I mean, to find a designer who wouldn't use that, that's really hard. <laughs> because I mean, the whole point, the whole reason you have the job is to, is to make, you know, help people make certain decisions. Um, that's, a, that's a tricky one, man. Yeah. It's like, imagine talking to e-commerce companies about, you shouldn't just push people to buy more. <laughs> be like, why do I exist? What's my purpose here? These guys want to collect data. 
I mean, in one sense, you're absolutely right. You kind of feel it somewhere deep down because they are smoothening this whole data collection experience <laughs> with cookies. But really, what they want is they're trying to say, if you really want your data. Yeah, that's what chose me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is a large company, so you know how the bigger the company that you give your data to, uh, the more easy it is for them to profit from us because they're working in, as a sort of aggregation network. It's sold on and aggregated, and you're targeted as an individual. And is it not possible that there's this central, one central data collection system? So if any company wants, well, you can just tap into it. If you've signed up into that data, central data collection, you get it, Do we have anything like that yet? Uh, sorry? Like there's somewhere you can update your information if you want. Yeah. Then if any company wants to tap into this, Mm -hmm. information, they just ask you, the, are you a member of this one? And then they go grab it ah, there. Okay. Instead of this repetitive, I give here, I give there, I give here, and everything is I think we should be moving towards something like that. Because if there's a center system. centralized, I'm not aware of this, but. But if there was one finish, finish that they give this opportunity that you mm. can cut up the access at any point. Mm. So if I give you the access to this company, and I, okay, tomorrow I don't want you to have access to it, then I stop it. Yeah. But of course, they cannot tell them what they know about me already, but at least I can stop every time I want. Yeah. Sorry. Just yeah. Oh, is there any reason why, or there's a legal reason why they have to do it individually, each company? Sorry? Or is there any legal reason why each company have to ask individually? I think this yeah, is a pretty complex, like, legal, global, like, a whole data, yeah, mess situation. And that's, that's again a very complex conversation. I think there are, there are lots of regulate. I mean like, there's not regulations, but there's like all kinds of, you know, associations and bodies and governments and yeah. getting involved now, trying to figure out this, you know, people also trying to contribute and find some common ground. But we, I think we are so early in the process that we are far from finding something. But I think there's hope because we are all suddenly now sensitive. We are all like, we are aware that this whole data thing is a big, you know, it's bad if we don't make if we don't make it right. And that's why, like, we avoid the third party usually when there's an agreement. Yeah, I have to move on, guys, because I have to focus on the behavioral part. That's a wrong. She, yeah. Okay, what about this one? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I wouldn't mind. Uh, actually, why don't you guys come here? Hey, join us. Come. Stand, yeah, stand, stand. yeah, yeah, the stanza okay. space. Looks nice. Yeah, please. Here, there. I actually just want to get coffee really quick. We have another half an hour for this session. Uh, so we are, we are doing good. I just want to get a quick coffee. Please, be here. please talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything to say? Do you have a critical? <laughs> Do you have a critical um, take on that one? <laughs> no. I think it's pretty good. I think it's, 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 a, it's a good development inside email because one benefit that they have, by the way, is that they are oops, they're mining all the text that you write in your email. Yeah. They're not doing it consciously, but uh, the algorithms are reading your emails, of course, right? You know that, right? Mm -hmm. And all of your emails, even though it's encrypted, it won't be, that information will never sit on anyone else's, uh, in some sense, accessible location other than yours and your, the person you're sending it to and so on. I mean, encryption is a complex thing. It's, it's, you could say it's very secure, but still, how else do they know that when you're typing email, it auto-suggests now? And that's pretty good. Have you seen that? It's like it's writing emails for you. They're saving time. They are saving, and they just they drive your, you know, how you phrase your email. You start to say thanks for that, and it shows up. Looking forward to the meeting next week or whatever, right? So they have that data, and because if you use a word in there like critical or important or high value, then the algorithm knows that that email is important. So it's easier for the algorithm to flag that email four days later and say, 
It's been four days. Are you doing anything about this? This email has the word high value in it, man. Are you attending to this high value email? That's what that's doing. Right? Is high value useless? <laughs> it could be. Could have been high value trash. I don't know. High value trash. The algorithm doesn't know that. But they're calling that a nudge. And that's interesting because that's the first time I've seen the word nudge itself used in, on an interface. Uh, and nudge theory was essentially developed by world leading behavioral economists uh, who wrote the book called Nudge, who also wrote a book called Misbehave, and uh, was, uh, he actually won a Nobel for it. So two economists have won Nobels uh, in the last 25 years or so for their work in behavioral economics. This guy and this other dude who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. If there's one book you need to read on behavioral design and behavior and psychology and neuroscience, it's Thinking Fast and Slow. It's like the Bible. It's, I, I love that book. It's dense, full of good research, real stuff. Real, real research, real scholars. But anyway, based on the work of those guys, we came up, we came up with this nudge theory. And nudging essentially is the idea that you can, you know, create choices. It's how you design choices in a particular environment that you can influence people, you can nudge them to take certain paths. And therefore, nudging has been used a lot in policy. It's been used a lot in things like uh, trying to help people donate their organs or to drive carefully or to, I don't know, like stay out of alcohol. Uh, and stuff like that. It's been used in a lot of social uh, social impact space. It's not really been used that much in the digital space. So all of those interventions are non-digital, most nudge interventions. And there's, the UK government actually created something called the Nudge Unit. They created a specialist body inside their organization, which has been very, very successful. And because they've been successful, the government of Singapore now has its own Nudge Unit and a few other countries are starting to build their own behavioral science units. <coughs> but they're not for profit, they're not about selling, they're about you know, developing healthy behaviors in people and in society. Pay your taxes on time. That's an important nudge. Because you're going to have to pay them anyway. Why do you want to have the headache and the pain of delaying it? But a lot of people just default on paying taxes because they just don't have somehow a nudge at the right time to say do it now. Stuff like that. Um, so, but that's the first time I've seen a nudge, so-called nudge, on a digital interface. And I think more of them are coming. So that was the first part, guys, really. And I have a few more examples. Um, that's the first part. I have a few more examples. And then actually I have this thing called the behavior design canvas, which is the second part. So how is it so far? Is it heavy, tiring, all good? Smooth, we're good, we're here. Excellent. Great. Um, I could go into the behavior design canvas already, uh, since we have 20 minutes. And when we come back, we can work with it. In fact, when we come back, we'll work on motivation. And from there, we'll work on with the canvas a little bit, because the human, the psychology of motivation is a big part of the canvas. Yeah? So then, when I started to research this stuff, uh, personally, this is my. I have a, a behavioral lab, little consultancy called Fabric. We work with a bunch of companies. I started to do research into behavioral science like ten years, actually longer since I studied psychology. But very seriously, I started to look into the research that could be applied in the digital domain about ten years ago. And you you see that you have all this stuff, like I said, going on. And then I said, okay, I'm not a PhD. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I'm an applied psychologist. I want to apply it in my project. How do I get a whole team if I just have to come to the shortcut and we guys are working on a behavioral change project? How do I get the entire team to engage and work without asking them to read 20 books, right? And then I said, why don't, why don't I create a canvas? Because canvases are so well known. People know how to use them. Everyone's familiar with them, they're visual, and they're collaborative. The best thing about design work is always collaborative. Design doesn't happen. The myth of the lone genius is for the previous generation of designers. Um, digital design 
actually no one owns it. The team owns it. So we come to the table, you say something, I say something, you build on that. Bara bara hey. Bara 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 bara. You just you build on something and you get to a point we suddenly have this awesome design, but it's not owned by anybody, it's owned by the entire team. So how can you do this behavioral design in a collaborative setting? I was very interested in that. And so I combined a few different like key models and I came up with this. This is available, it's available there for free download. Uh, so I've been refining it and refining it for three and a half years now. And I finally decided that I just put it online and if you go there and there's a simple form, I want to get your email so I know who's downloaded the canvas, of course. Uh, and that's the only kind of uh, thing that I'm asking at that point. But the idea for me is to like spread this tool. I want more people to use it, give me feedback. And I'm working on a book on the tool and so on. So that's what the canvas looks like. And it's basically uh, a way to design behavioral change in three main steps which you can see at the top. The first step is target, the second step is align, and the third step is shape. And again, if anything is too abstract or like too vague, just tell me like what the hell is that. But basically what's going on is that in this part of the canvas, you're trying to get very focused about the desired behavior and the behavioral change. So this is, the, this is what the user or the human does currently. And this is the target behavior that we would like the human being to do. It starts with that. Because all behavioral change, intervention, nudge theory, all of that stuff has to do with behavioral targeting. It starts with, it's a little bit of a cart before the horse kind of a thing, where you first figure out what is it you want people to do. Um, that's the first part. And you won't, you, sometimes it can be very easy, but for a large company or depending on your organization, just getting to those target behaviors can be very hard. Uh, is there anybody who, who works in corporate, in a corporate organization? And if you work in a corporate organization, you, do, you must have heard of digital transformation, right? A lot of companies are talking about digital transformation. How do you, I am an energy company, I am a legacy company, I'm a railway, and how do I transition to a digital railway? How do I transition to a digital bank? Banks are facing this huge problem because they've been doing business a certain way for, I don't know, a thousand years. And now, this new technology comes along to trying to be a digital bank. <clears throat> so what behavioral changes should the bank's employees do in order for you to become digital? It just doesn't happen like that. You have to do business differently. Your employees have to behave differently. Sometimes I have projects where just figuring this out is the entire project. What change do you want your employees to do? If the shortcut says, tomorrow we want to not offer uh, courses the way we are doing it now. We are, we are doing it in a particular way now, and tomorrow we want to do it in a different way. We want to change our model of delivery. How, what are the behaviors that the employees, the trainers, the volunteers, how and what should they do differently? So this whole going from the present to the desired behavior part, this can be quite a significant work. Sometimes it can be very simple. Today we'll go to the very simple example. And usually your business goal says some, you know, influences it. Your revenue model influences it. Do you want to make money out of data? Do you want to charge people for the product? Is it freemium? This, you know, what's your revenue model? What is the behavioral change you're looking for? And then what kind of user insight do you have? I mean, do you have any user research? Do you have any customer research? Like how do you, you know, do you, have you talked to your employees exactly like you said? Do you have that user insight? Do you have the customer insight? All of that stuff goes into this first part. And this is the more straightforward part. The second part is where it gets fun and more tricky. And that's where the behavioral science comes in. It turns out that in order to, for anybody to do anything, we need something called motivation. The smallest, smallest thing, getting out of bed, going to the washroom to brush your teeth, needs motivation. That's why some days you wake up and you feel like, I can't go anywhere. You're under motivated, right? From that act to the biggest act, painting the biggest thing, you know, 
you know, creating a, a masterpiece or traveling the planet or going to the moon, human behavior, action, needs this thing called motivation. And that's a huge subject. There's lots of different models, books, ideas around motivation. But this second part tries to simplify all that down. And the goal here is to understand, is the user, I'm sorry to use the word user, it's just user-centered design language. Uh, I don't mean like a drug user. But is the user motivated to do the target behavior? Yes, you want the person to do something, but are they motivated to do it? If they are, then you have a different strategy. And if they are not, then you have a different strategy. And I think most change projects, they don't consider this. They get, try to get people to do things without looking at their own motivation. Right? And the last piece, this is something called a habit loop, again from habit psychology. Once you do understand, once you do motivate them, how do you get them to do the behavior repeatedly? And I don't mean like three <coughs> times a day, ten times a day, but it's enough frequency to form some sort of a you know, behavioral pattern or a habit. Those are the three steps. Target the behavior, align the behavior with motivation, and then shape that behavior over time. I know it sounds really cold, right? There is emotion in this. If you're asking me, where is the emotion? Where's the human being? It's there, and it's in the emotion. It's in the motivation part. Because motivation is essentially an emotional drive. There is no cold machine in here which wants things, which moves, without any emotion attached to it. It is the love for something, the striving for something, the aspiration that inspires and motivates. So the emotion is very much there. I just don't bring it out because it's just a very complex space to go into. So that's what I did. I took all of this stuff and turned it into this. And so when you're using this as a team on a behavioral change project, you can actually, you can actually over time figure out, OK, when do we use priming? When do we look at cognitive biases? How can we apply gamification? The problem with just this is that designers don't know when to use what. You have a huge bag of tools, but you don't know when to use what. And I try to give it some kind of order and pattern, and that's the <coughs> So I know it sounds a bit abstract, because it is. When you come back, we will do a couple of exercises, and it will become so much more simple. Great, we're on a break. Yeah. Thank you.